Fantastic. Hey, man. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another show on Anderson's TV. And today, my special guest is Pete Thorne. Uh, just relax. You've not done YouTube before, I don't think, have you? No, so this is all. I'm very nervous. Very nervous. First time. <laughs> so be nice, everybody. Uh, no, Pete's over. Um, doing some sur uh, gigs and tours and stuff in Europe. Um, we thought we'd invite him on to talk about uh, life, the universe, and, and everything, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess... Most people will be familiar with you, you know, via your YouTube channel. But yeah. life as a guitar player, you know, there was a world before YouTube. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, some people um, they, they don't know that about me. It's funny. It's funny. <laughs> some guy put a, a comment on a video recently. And said, "Well, that's cool. He does all this YouTube stuff, but can he play in a band?" <laughs> <laughs> Well, there was this 20 years before YouTube. That, and, that, yeah. and that's I thought it would be fun to to get to know you a bit. Um, about you know life and stuff. So, so tell us about you know growing up and and what it was that drew you to to want to you know to the guitar. I grew up uh, in Canada, and I was in Edmonton, Canada. A kid moved into my neighborhood down the street from me. He was a couple years older than me, and he was like this ridiculous musician. That he was so he was a quiet kind of shy guy, and he actually like just kind of maybe didn't uh, form friendships and stuff like that that easy because he was almost maybe he was a little on the spectrum or something mm -hmm. like that you know and he was really like when I think back on it it's like how was he that good he could play keys he could play some guitar and he had this massive record collection so I guess he was a little bit of an outcast or something and the kids in the hood wouldn't hang out with him really okay. but he because he was listening to like Frank Zappa yes the who you know he had this really deep yeah. you know uh, musical taste well, I was this goofy little kid from up the block or whatever, and I just found this guy fascinating, and he really turned me on to music. Okay. So, and how old, is, how old was this? Uh, I was like 10 or 11. So it's young yeah. to be a Zappa fan, isn't it, right? Totally, yeah. yeah. And he could play, like, he was really into the jam and, like, really cool music, and he played, like, electric piano really well. And I think back on it, he was, like, you know, he was probably 14 or something. Okay. So anyways, he would, he would be nice enough to let me hang out sometimes, and he would, you know, either stick the headphones on my head or say, sit in the chair. This is back in LP days, and he'd sit me in the chair and say, here, just, here's Sergeant Peppers. Read the, you know, read the LP jacket and just listen and concentrate, and I'd be like, okay. And he was kind of like my big brother or something yeah. that I didn't have. So he was really cool. He moved away a couple years after that, but that got me into into music and listening. He showed me my first my first stuff on the guitar, which was. You know, the who? And that was like I was off and running after that. I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. So that got me into into music. And what, was it a musical family as well, or was there was were you you know mom and dad kind of. A bit anti the guitar or um no they they were totally into it i actually started on violin i don't know why but i i, I at, at some point heard some fiddle and i was like that's cool and my parents said okay we'll get you a little violin and you can take some music lessons but i quickly moved to guitar and yeah. focused on that but my parents weren't really musical my sister was way, was way into like early kind of you know british heavy metal and stuff she loved she loved uh, uh, maiden and priest and oh, okay. certainly sabbath yeah. and an aussie and so i was hearing all that from her and then my buddy bob he was playing me all that he kind of frowned on all that and he was much more kind of snobby into you know <laughs> like i say zappa and he was into into stuff like that so i was, I was getting these uh different influences coming from, oh, cool. from them. Yeah. so did you relatively quickly once you you got that first guitar did you start getting you know formal lessons or was it you know self-taught or what yeah, my my uh, my violin teacher played a little bit of guitar, so he showed me a couple things. And after that, he said, "You know, I'm not really a guitar player, so you should go see this guy." And he turned me on to a, a fellow named Terry McDade, who's still an active instructor, teacher. He comes from a very musical family. His fan, they, they've got a uh, a band called uh, the McDades. Actually, they've won Junos, which is like the Grammys in Canada. Okay, uh, and they're like a really really you know, cool family band. Everybody plays in that family. So Terry, he was, he was the father and he, uh, he was a great teacher and he showed me lots of stuff. And kind of similar to the, the violin teacher, after a few years he said, you know, you should maybe, maybe move on to a different teacher. I've sort of showed you maybe all that I think I can show you. Go check out this guy Brian Hughes for some lessons. So I went to Brian and he's a uh, really great jazz guitar player. He's kind of heavily influenced by Matheny mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I went to Brian and, and he was nice enough 
uh, to actually let me get up on stage. He would do playing like local uh, cover bands and stuff, even though he was kind of a jazzer at heart. And he'd, you know, playing rock music, pop music and stuff. And he'd get me up to play when I was like, eh, this is when I was 14, 15. Yeah. And let me sit in with his band. Somehow I got into these clubs in Edmonton. I don't know why they let me in, but I guess I was tall. I looked like I could, <laughs> you know. So, th so that was really cool. So I got to sit in and stuff and do that kind of thing. And by then I was like, you know, it was the 80s. And it was that magic time and where guitar was exploding. And uh, you know yeah. you had Eric Johnson and Steve Vai and Satriani, of course Van Halen and all these people coming up, and it was just really, really a. Uh, so they they were your idols, were they? Those guys. Yeah, I mean, started out the core was the Beatles, really, and right. the Who, and so I started there, which. I always say after Shred kind of fell out of fashion in the, you know, because I, I, I was into working at, you know, my Paul Gilbert videos and stuff. And then for a minute there, it wasn't cool to play solos in the 90s. And uh, the kind of the, the root being in the Beatles and the Who and stuff like that really kind of saved me because it was like, well, that's OK. I don't, I don't have to play guitar solos. I can, you know, you know work for the song and all that kind mm. of stuff. And that, that was a good thing. But yeah. I guess so timing wise for you then, you, you just as you were coming out the sort of 80s into the 90s then, was that when you were reaching that sort of crossroads in your life about going, so, proper job, a guitar player, right. <laughs> make the decision. Yeah, well, I knew I really wanted to, to go to L.A. and play guitar. That's what I wanted right. to do because it seemed like everybody wanted to go to GIT. It was yeah. that or Berkeley, you know. And um, GIT seemed like kind of my, you know, it was a little more rock and roll or something. So I was like, I'm going there. When I was 14 or 15, I, had, I can remember sitting at my kitchen table at home, uh, home from lunch one day from school, reading the GIT catalog and going, Mom, I'm going to go to this school. This is what I want to do. And then I did. You know, when I was 19, I, I, was, I was off to L.A. and... Who, 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 were the, who were the standout teachers at GIT at that time? Because they get some uh, crazy, you know... Famous guys. They do. I mean, my my orientation week was nuts. It was Michael Hedges doing a concert, and uh, who else did I see that week? Oh, I and mean, it was just like so many people. You know, Paul Gilbert had already kind of moved on, but Russ right. Parrish, who's you know Satchel. From, yes. Yeah, he was there, and he he had been Paul's roommate. So those two guys, he was like his, no almost like his understudy, I think. So sorry. So Russ yeah. was teaching there. Or? He was. Yeah. Wow. And he was a year younger than me. I think he was eighteen, and I was nineteen. And he was already, you know, he, I think, dropped out of high school to go to MI. And he's had a career. I, I must admit, side point here. Yeah. Uh, we have tried, I've tried to contact him to invite him on the show. Oh, but, yeah. but as himself, rather than, oh. you know, just, <laughs> but it's like, I, you can't, it's almost impossible to, to find any way of contacting him other than as Satchel. Yeah, but if yeah. you're watching... I don't want to. I don't want to blow it for him, but he's a really <laughs> sweet guy. He's a very different persona. That, that's you know, what I've heard. I love his. I love his like '80s rock star yeah. persona too. But he's a really. I actually got to got to see him a little while ago. Uh, he was by my studio because there's another fellow at yeah. his studio in my building, same building. He was working in there, and it was like, dude, I haven't seen you forever. It's great to see you. And we we kind of chatted for a while about the. I mean, I've, he was one of the very first people I met 30 years ago when I, when I went to LA. For that's so. crazy. So he was he was awesome. And who else was there? Uh, Nick Nolan was a really important. You, got, you guys might not have heard of him, but he does a lot of film and TV music now, I mm -hmm. think. And he was my private instructor at MI. And Scott Henderson was there, and I used to just go sit in his open counseling and be like scared because yeah. I didn't want to. I was like, I don't want to pick up the guitar around this guy. But I, you know, it was great to sit in there and watch him. And it was a, it was a really good time, my MI days for sure. Yeah. It, it it feels to me like that was LA kind of heyday. It yeah. sort of feels more recently that. People are moving away. Nashville's become, you know, more the mecca for guitar players now. Kind of, of, true. of all genres. But at, yeah. the, at the time, did it really feel like, you know, L.A. was the center of the kind of the rock guitar universe? Yeah, it did. I mean, when I got there, it was 90. So there was no Seattle yet. And it was still yeah. all happening. And I can remember, you know, probably arriving on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday or something. And then that weekend going out to the Strip and just being like, oh, my God. Like it was, you couldn't even walk on the Sunset Strip back then. It was just packed with people and bands handing out their flyers. Four or five bands a night in every club there. And it, it, was, it was nuts. I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, a couple of years after that... I was down there and spending time uh, out mostly in kind of the Pasadena, Arcadia area, working with a band, writing songs and doing stuff. So I wasn't really going out that much anymore. We were like concentrating on this band I was in and, you know, getting work done. Well, we got a gig at the Troubadour. Mm -hmm. And it was around, this is around mid-92, maybe 93. And we got this gig at the Troubadour. It was a Friday night. And the set was probably 9 p.m., something like that. So I went and did the set. And as anybody that's ever played the Troubadour knows, after you're done, they dump you out in the alley in the back with all your gear. <laughs> so you can't really hang out. So I loaded it up in the car. 
And, uh, and I drove up Doheny up to Sunset Boulevard. Primetime Friday night, this would be about 10.30 after our set. And I turned right on Sunset Boulevard and I drove down past the Roxy and the whiskey and stuff and it was empty. And it was Friday night. I mean, there was no, nothing going on. And I went, oh my God, this is all gone. And it was Seattle. That's what had happened. Oh, right. Yeah, it was that time, 92, 93, and Nirvana and everything had happened. And it was just, um, it was just really dead down there. And I went, whoa. But an interesting thing happened in L.A. after that. Um, things kind of got more eclectic because it was really only, I mean, there was kind of the East Hollywood thing going on. There was bands like Jane's Addiction and stuff happening that were different than the hair metal thing, mm-hmm. you know. But that hair metal kind of, it, 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 it sort of needed to, what happened needed to happen, right? It was getting pretty, you know, just kind of eating itself, a yep. little bit trite and everything. And then there was a musical revolution with Seattle. And, and then L.A. got really interesting. In the, in the later part of the 90s when I was kind of coming up and stuff, there was just a lot of different scenes going on. A lot of different, there was still a lot of bands playing and music happening and, and, and clubs and stuff. It just got a lot more uh, varied. So, right, but I would agree with you. Uh, Nashville kind of seems to be the you know seems to be cool at the moment, doesn't it? But yeah. So so what? Did, where did you? So you're in LA, you know, still relatively young, but now looking for work, I guess, looking for band work yeah. anyway. So what what did what did you do? What 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 kind of came your way, or did you did you feel the need to move, or what? You know, I got in this band that the band I mentioned that was out kind of based in Arcadia, Pasadena area. Is that my buddy um, Frank Symes, who at the time he was uh, playing with uh, Don Henley, who was his musical director as well as Mick Jagger, he'd just gotten a gig with him, so I nice. thought this is a good guy to yeah. know. He, he found me through the musician's referral at MI, actually. So we started working together and writing songs and stuff, and he, you know, he was late 30s, I was 1920 at the time, I guess, mm-hmm. so he was kind of a real mentor to me. Taught me a lot about recording, about engineering, about yeah. writing songs, and we put this band together and we worked for four or five years trying to get a deal, and we finally got signed over in at Japan, interestingly enough. He was fluent. Uh, in Japanese because he'd grown up there. Oh, cool. And yeah, and he was he was uh, half Japanese, you know. So he he was a, a really interesting cat, great guitar player. This guy Frank Symes. Um, so, anyways, we got signed over in in Japan. Uh, the record was half in Japanese and half in English, wow. and that was my foray first, you know, into becoming like now I'm a professional musician. So yeah. that was around ninety five, ninety six. What was the name of that band? It's called the Surreal McCoys. Trying to oh, find that. Oh, what record. a great name, the Surreal McCoys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like a Beatle-y pop influence. It was, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I know a little bit of a tangent here, but um, we had Marty Friedman on earlier this year and oh, yeah. we talked a lot about Japan. And mm. it just seems to be this crazy microculture that's got all these kind of Western guitar influences, but then they sort of... They sort of chew it up and spit it out as something uniquely Japanese that's as it. well. Exactly. But so, yeah, what was your... You know, experience of all that. Well, I'll tell you, that was my first kind of, uh, you know, jaunt over there and doing business over there and stuff. And I was in love with the place from the moment I landed. Right. I don't know what it was, but I just bonded with it. And it was great. And the band only lasted about a year after that. And the deal kind of, you know, it was cool for a minute, but it never really went anywhere after that. And it sort of fell apart. That was depressing for me because I loved Japan. Yeah. And I, I had bought into this idea. Maybe I can have kind of a second career over here and spend a lot of time here because I love Japan. Well, all these years later, you know, moving forward to 2014, I got the gig with uh, Chiyoshi Nagabuchi, who's like a big rock star since mm-hmm. the 70s in Japan. So I've spent about a year over there in total, like, of my life, I guess, since then, on tour and doing stuff. And I love that place, man. And Marty's, like, he's certainly embraced it wholeheartedly. Yeah, he's, he's saying yeah. he's like a real TV celebrity. He's, like, more known as a TV celebrity really? over there than as a guitar player. Yeah, he's on, like, cookery programs and all kind of That's stuff. That's amazing. I didn't know yeah, that. But yeah, he's a very cool guy. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go back to L.A. then. Yeah. Uh, bands kind of falling apart, a bit of, like, you know, oh, no, what am I going to do now? So, yeah. so, so what did you do? Well, it's interesting because after that, I went through the next five, six, seven, eight years of playing in bands, doing like a couple more signed bands and trying to make that work, but then also making these sort of inroads into the uh, side guy world, you know, mm-hmm. getting, getting gigs uh, as, a, as a player on tours. And, um, and that was cool to me because it was like, oh, it's similar. Like I can go out and play with bands. I'm just not maybe the main songwriter or one of the songwriters. I'm, I'm learning these songs that these people write, but I get to play in like pretty cool big venues, go yeah. on the road and earn some money. And there was also an element of um, independence about it. Like what you think maybe like when you start a band when you're young and you get signed to a deal like, the, oh, that's we're, we're a band. We're going to be independent. We're going to do our own thing. But actually the reality is Many times, because of the way those deals are structured, there'll be one guy that's the primary member or something, right. and you're kind of underneath them. And, and besides that, uh, it's like 
many times you're locked down and, and you know, you can't really do anything else because you're signed to that deal on that label and you don't have that much freedom. Right. And if the label guy comes along, the A&R guy, and says like, oh, you know, like we don't hear a hit or whatever, you guys got to go back in the studio and write some more songs. Then you spend the next six months doing that and you don't really have that much freedom. As a sideman, I found like, hey, I can go from this gig to this gig to this gig and move around, take different gigs. And I had this independence working, okay. play different kinds of music. And so that was really fun. So I started to get um, gigs with folks like uh, Leonard Cohen's son, Adam Cohen. That was one of my first tours. He had a deal in Columbia and, you know, got a, got a tour with him, went out tour all around the States and Canada, a little bit of Europe. That was a lot of fun. A band called Blinker the Star. They were signed to DreamWorks Records at the time. Really, really cool uh, Canadian band. Uh, and yeah, just did, did some tours with folks like that. Around 2000, 2001, I got the gig. It was actually 2001 because it was right after 9-11 happened. And the band Five for Fighting needed a guitar player. I got the gig and they were just kind of taking off right then. They had this song called Superman that was sort of widely seen as like an anthem to the, uh, the firefighters and okay. emergency personnel when, when 9-11 happened. So, th and that was, a, you know, John Androzic, he's a really great songwriter and uh, took me out on the road and so I did that for the next year and that was like okay now we're out on tour with Goo Goo Dolls and some bigger bands and stuff and playing yeah. festivals and and you know it was going from there so yeah so that so now we're we're into the 21st century I guess now yep. um so I suppose yeah the, we're still probably seven or eight years pre-YouTube at the moment aren't we so yeah. so it, but your career is you've done the Sideman bit you've had your own band did, <sighs> It sounds from what you've said that you're kind of quite comfortable doing either. But was there a was there a sort of an internal nagging to sort of you know do do your own thing or you know yeah um, what I was realizing was I was always hunting for work. Mm -hmm. You know, as a musician, we get used to like you know it's like well, job security is knowing what you're doing for the next month or two, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was my life for the next. I mean, moving on from there, it was like I I got a gig touring with a guy named Robbie Draco Rosa, a really great. Latin music artist, then with Jewel finally, and then I moved on to Chris Cornell after that. And but it was still I was I was always sort of relying on other folks to hire me mm -hmm. uh, for work. As that was all happening and building from say 2000 to 2010, I guess 2006 is when I got the YouTube channel. Uh, and it was very by accident. It, it, maybe you can relate to this, but yeah. we got this YouTube thing. I don't know. That's cool. I can make videos, lessons, or something. I don't know. Like maybe I'll show this new amp I've got. <laughs> and it, it was that just really haphazard and. All of a sudden, it, it was growing and just kind of organically becoming this thing and it and became more and more a part of what I do to the point where now it's like maybe the primary thing that I do. It's, yeah. it's definitely, um, I, again, the, the YouTube thing, similarly to you, we started doing it yeah. with no expectations or, or right. understanding of what it might become. Yeah. And it absolutely, even if I think back to what I even then thought it might be yeah. it never ended up being you know I, yeah. I i i honestly thought anderton's youtube channel at the beginning was going to be like qvc uh -huh. I, I thought we'd have some i thought we'd talk about a product and we'd have some technological magic way of having like a counter in the corner of the screen that would go as all the ones who <laughs> sold it and then we would do videos and just tumbleweed would blow across the storefront <laughs> not sell anything at all right and okay, we quickly a bit like you i think you, you find you find a connection though with the audience. What you know for us, it, yeah. it was about just messing around, having fun. And for you, I think the, the songwriting and the you know it's a way of showing your music, but also yeah. showing tips and tricks and stuff at the same time and gear, obviously. Uh, but all, yeah. I think all the successful YouTube channels have kind of they found that one thing that connects them, and, and it's a unique thing. That's the key. Is like you you come up with your own angle yeah. uh, with uh, uh, your your approach, and it's important if anybody out there is interested in doing YouTube to think of that thing. You know, come up with. I did a video with Paul Davids recently, and he said, "Have an idea," and I think he meant an idea. Maybe he was talking about an idea in particular for a video, like have some a cool concept. But ex ex expanding on that, I think it's important to have an idea for your channel and really think about it. If, if I'd known what YouTube was gonna become, I wouldn't have called my channel some you know, weird acronym. It's like S-I-N-A-S-L-1, which meant stranger in a strange land. <laughs> oh, I would've okay. called it Pete Thorne YouTube or yes. something would be the URL, you know? And I was, luckily they, they allowed you to change it later on, you know? Um, but yeah, and, and also just the focus of the channel you know, mine, mine became a lot about, you know, lessons, teaching, music, but also kind of very gear-focused. Yeah. I learned later on, uh, there's folks like Leo from Frog Leap. 
you know, he's a bona fide, really successful independent music artist, and his formula was make great, cool videos yeah. that are really fun to watch, covers of yeah. mainly like pop songs done in metal that you wouldn't think you could do metal, and he makes it work, and it's it's incredible. Yeah. So he's got a a real wide reach because of that. So lately, I've been thinking yeah. about. Uh, you know, how can I reach more people? I started this So You Want to Be a Pro Musician right. series uh, talking about, you know, kind of just, you know, pointers and tips and stuff if you, if you want to do this crazy thing for a living. And I thought, well, this is a way I can reach maybe, you know, vocalists and bass players, keyboard players. It doesn't have to be just guitar players. How can I broaden it's that a, reach? It is a crazy world. It is yeah. a, you're talking about the Leo thing. Yeah. Rabir, you know, oh, yeah. we, we work closely with Rabir, who's now doing the guitar stuff for, for Leo. Yeah. And Leo, off the back of the YouTube success, is headlining festivals with 50,000 people there <laughs> yeah, with his YouTube band. It's like, and, yeah. I, and, and I think in a way, I remember Rob Chapman saying this to me, you know, a few years ago, you've got to get over this whole YouTube. They're just musicians. Yeah. It's like, forget, you know, it, they're not YouTube musicians. They're just musicians yeah you know, sure we like, all did well and that's kind of what we're getting around to with this right like yeah. there was a lot of playing and stuff before this you know yeah and it's like that's why it's so funny when somebody was like but he can't he play in a band it's like dude that's all i ever did this is the new thing you yeah. know the youtube but you know reaching people um via youtube has given us this independent way uh and it's also given us total freedom to do whatever whatever the hell we want to do, you know, without like having to have, I, <clears throat> I talk about this in my clinic a lot that I'm out here doing right now, where it's like, you, you don't have anybody there to tell you you're too young, you're too old, you're not playing the right kind of music, you don't look right, you've got a funny name, you need to change yeah. your name or whatever. You don't have anybody doing that stuff. It's just you and your thing. Yeah. And boom, you reach people, you know, just without any kind of middleman. And I love that. Yeah, that's cool. So, yeah. So we, we kind of, right now, and, and I guess for the last... Uh, ten years or so, you're, you've you've become, I think, the sort of the, the 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 model modern day working musician, which is, it's all about having your finger in a few pies. Yeah, yeah. that's Do, true. You know, and I think, and both financially, but also um, to fulfil that sort of musical. Need, you know, just do do a few things. But yeah. you want to just just give it give. You know, what is a typical month or two months for you in terms of you know what 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 you might do nowadays man it's pretty random like this year has gotten real uh sort of piecemeal like you say it's throwing a hundred things at the wall and seeing mm. what sticks um which is really fun because there's variety then and you know you're not yep. locked into any one thing for too long when you go on tour just sort of by default yeah you're on tour and every day is different but it's also kind of institutionalized living in that you're on a bus and there's a routine and you're out there and it's hard to do anything else you know, a lot of people, when they hear about the tour salary of a kind of a, a bigger touring mm -hmm. act, they might think like, oh, wow, that's a lot of money. But keep in mind, when you're on tour, it's 24 hours a day. Like, you can't really do anything else. You're not going to be able to get another gig mm -hmm. in, in town where you live and go because you're out traveling. Yeah. So the, the thing is now, it's like it, with the kind of like, I'm, I'm doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, I've been subbing with the Ultimate uh, Queen celebration, which is Mark Martell, the guy that sings oh, cool. uh, Queen so yeah. well. They have me in uh, when Tristan, their regular guitar player, needs to go do another gig. So I've been doing that a little bit. I got three gigs with them next month. You know, I've got like a whole slew of pedals to do videos for. Um, I'm doing this, you know, European clinic tour. So every week is like different stuff, you know. And it's it's interesting because I feel I feel bad sometimes because there's a lot of folks that want the the videos for the pedals done and stuff. And I have to say it's going to be like maybe 45 days before I can get to it because I've got all these other yep. things going on. And I can only make so many videos at once. It's writing the song, filming the song, getting a good tone, doing all that, turning on the camera, getting all the clip. I mean, you guys know what goes into making these things, but I do that all by myself. Yeah. So each, I can only do like a couple of those a week. And that's like working all week. So it's just, I'm always busy. Um, but yeah, it's a random hodgepodge of stuff. <laughs> do, do, you, you know? do you ever think... Uh, are you very, very, very uh, satisfied with your lot, or do, is there part of you that goes, oh, I wish I could have been one of those '80s supergroups and just not, not, you know, like, uh, yeah. Do, do, do you sort of um, what? What's the right? I'm not saying do you resent any of it, but was there part of you that goes, oh, you know what? In a perfect world, I would have just been Slash, you know? <laughs> or, you know, I, I asked myself. I know what you're saying. I asked myself. Uh, back when I got out of MI, um, like, what do you really want to do? Like, what is it that you want to do? And really, all I wanted to do was be in a band, a cool band that wrote cool songs. You know, I wanted to be, you know, Neil from Journey or something. You yeah. know, <laughs> that that would be the ultimate for me. 
but it never quite works out maybe the way that you thought it would, much like you were saying about the YouTube channel. Yeah. It goes a different road, but a big part of this whole thing is being flexible. Because, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen in five years. I don't Maybe YouTube won't be the thing. There'll be some other platform. And being flexible and open to that kind of stuff really helps you to move in your career. You know, it's allowed me to, um, like keeping an open mind has allowed me to work for the last 25 years, mm -hmm. I guess, and not have to get a day job since the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> so for that, I'm thankful. And I'm, I'm open to whatever comes. Yeah, I think ultimately, man, I mean, you know, if, uh, if you could be the guitar player and, you know, be it, you know, Def Leppard or the Foo Fighters or the Pretenders or whatever the band is, that would be really cool. Yeah. But, um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stoked. You know? Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, well, look, we, we, should, um, we should talk about gear. Yeah. Now, you're, you're obviously in a unique, well, not a unique position, but you're obviously in a very well-qualified position because, you know, you've done the big clubs, the small clubs, the albums, you mm. know, so you know kind of what you need your gear to do. Mm. Um, you obviously got a relationship with Sir. You've got guitars. You've got an amplifier, which is very, very cool, with, or two amplifiers, which we can talk about. Yeah you've managed to combine uh, modern multi-effects in with it. But let's talk about it. So where, where did you first, you know, where, was you, where did you first start to um, play your first Sur guitar? I bought it actually sight unseen. Uh, I came across the country. I found it in the classifieds of the gear page. And it looked like a nice one. It's the guitar that I did in that How to Play Eruption video series. That, uh, that was the one that I was playing in that. It's a, like a blue Sur classic. Cool. And so I got it for, you know, guy was selling it for a decent price. And I thought, I'm going to try these Sur guitars. I never tried one. So it was sent across the country from, I think, uh, uh, Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, some, somewhere to, uh, to L.A. And it arrived. I took it out of the case and I was playing it for a while. I thought, well, this is a really lovely guitar. And after about 45 minutes, I realized it was in tune and that I'd never <laughs> tuned it. <laughs> and I thought, this is a really good guitar. It came all the way across the country and it's still in tune. So that was really cool. Um, and so I contacted them. At the time, I think I was playing with Jewel, doing a tour with Jewel. And I contacted them and said, hey, I got this great guitar. I'm just, want, I know you guys are in Southern California somewhere. I'd love to just make contact with you. They said, you should come out of the factory sometime. So I went out there and met John, and, uh, and they gave me a tour of the place. And they were just really nice people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sort of long story short, it, it really went from there. And he's one of my best friends now. Oh, we talk cool. almost every day on the phone, just about guitar or about other things, about <coughs> life. And um, so it's that family kind of thing. And, yeah. just, and he's got an obsession about quality, uh, almost like OCD about everything being perfect. I, I got a guitar from, a, from a, another manufacturer once, and I was proud of it, kind of a custom-made one-off thing, you know. And I, I took it to him to show him, you know, and he, you know, he's, he's, he's jealous like anybody if you play there. So, but he grabbed the guitar and he, I handed it to him and he goes, let me see it. And he goes, you want me to tell you what's wrong with it? <laughs> I mean, he took a look at it for six seconds, you know, and he's, he sees things that I don't see, you know, like yeah. lines of things, the way that, you know, it, that's just the way he is. So, you know, <laughs> a while ago he had a guitar in the shop and he's like, check this out. It's beautiful. It's got a great top on it, but I, I can't sell it. You know, it's a second. I'm like, why? And he goes, oh, there's this little flaw right here. In the... And I'm like, no, I don't see so well. I've got wacky eyes, but <laughs> I'm looking at the thing and like, John, I don't see that. <laughs> I can't see it's, what you're talking about. You it know? is funny, isn't it? Because so. I, I kind of have this, um, I kind of have this uh, interesting relationship. I'm a big Fender and Gibson. I just, sure. you know, and, and it's almost like, Whenever, particularly, I think Fender, you know, when they try to do the modern, almost guess go a bit more sur stuff, yeah. and they sort of take away some of the things that are a bit quirky and not quite right about, or not not quite right is the wrong word, but you yeah. know what you know what I mean? Just like somehow, I just I miss them, you know. Yeah. I want you know I want it. I want to know that there are certain things that I know I should be a bit care like careful how much you use the trim or on the oh, Gibson, really? you, know, like, you know, like you kind of all half expecting the G string to not quite, but it's like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I like, I, I sort of, I like those. And I sometimes you find to with, fight you a bit. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> but, and I sometimes find with brands and I think of Paul Reed Smith is a good example where they've kind of just gone, well, we've ironed all those out. You right, know, right, it's right. Like, I'm sort of going like, Oh, I kind of miss them, you know. It's like yeah. it's a really irrational sort of. Uh, I totally understand. A really irrational sense, but yeah, I like it when it fights me a little bit sometimes. Yeah. For the my main, excuse me, gigging instruments and stuff, I, I like it to be a, a real, uh, you know, easy to play guitar, and I like it to stay in tune yeah. and be consistent and all that stuff. But I understand what you're saying. I did a video with Tim Pierce and Michael Thompson yeah. over at Michael's studio, 
And so I was telling the story last night at my clinic about how Michael said, hey, I thought it'd be fun if we could all play a solo over this track. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, I get to play with Michael and Tim. Yeah. I was like, not, a, not on the, in the hot seat or anything. And Michael hands me his guitar to play, and the action's like this. He, play, he has such high action, and it almost made it easier because it was so crazy that I had to play slow and very right. deliberate. But, you know, he, he said to me he likes the guitar to fight him a little bit, and it keeps him from overplaying. It slows down his vibrato a bit and makes him a little bit more deliberate. And I was like, I get that, you know. It's, yeah, so it's... I, I, that's cool. I, you know, it's a funny thing. I'll just say one more thing yeah, about yeah, that. Sure. I'd almost rather have it one way or the other. Like, I'd rather have a guitar like, you know, an old airline or national that is like, wow, this is like a bear, but it sure sounds cool, like a, an old blues machine or something. Yep. Or I'd rather have the thing be perfect. Because, like, if my truss rod is just a little bit too loose for me... I'm like, oh, the guitar's in Oh, I'm not, I'm not. And then I'll half a turn and then I'm yeah. stoked. Yeah. I, I think that's <laughs> a good shout. Like you say, just yeah. go one way or the other. It's, it's, I, I agree, it's a good shout. Yeah. Um, I mean, the amp's the newest thing, isn't it? So yes. it's not your first amp with Sur, is it? It's no. The, there's a big 100 watt one, which is, what, four or five years now? Maybe that's been around? Yeah, I think 2014. Right. Actually, so it was maybe six years was when we first brought it out. And that was really, actually, we, we had one, a custom audio branded version right. uh, in about 2008. I think that okay. came out um, and that was really a, just a happy accent like many things that have happened uh, with Sir John said I think I can make you happy with one amp I was using three amps on the road okay. switching between all three and he goes what are you using all these amps for I can make you one amp and so he had the, the custom audio OD 100s and that, that, those amps back then and he said why don't I just mod one that's kind of to your liking mm -hmm. and he, he said, okay, I've got an amp ready for you. Come down and check it out after I kind of told him the things I would want. And I drove out to the factory, and it was a uh, silk screen on the front PT-100. You know, he said, oh, I just did that for fun. I was so honored, you know, but it wasn't like a model. It was just like right. he'd done it for my personal amp. Well, I was playing with Chris Cornell then, and I took it out on the road, and I started to use it, and that became my main amp. And everybody's like, what's this PT-100? I want one of those, you know. So it went from there. Oh, and that's cool. we tweaked that amp. Over the next three, four, or five years, I guess 2008 to 2013, something like that, until we arrived at the amp that then became the Sur PT100. Yeah, yeah. And now, so obviously the, the that's the 100 watt one. Yeah. This is a 15 watt one with a few other features in here as well. Yeah. Where do you? What what was the drive? I'm talking about mainly the power side of things yeah. now. You know, because both are gigging amplifiers. Yeah. But what is it that you like about, you know, where, where would you want the 100 watts versus where would you want the 15 watts in terms of, you know? Well, it's a funny thing. I mean, things have happened since even we brought out the 100. Qu quieter stages has become like kind of the norm and in-ears have become the norm. It seems to be, be almost how everybody monitors now. Uh, and so the need for the 100 watts sort of becomes a little bit like, you know, how many situations do you need a 100 watt amp or can you even use one in these days? <laughs> yeah. Most of us are faced with, you know, turn down, you know, like, oh no, we don't want any cabs on stage and all that stuff, which we, we were talking a little bit about how we love to have a cab on stage earlier. Yeah. Uh, you know, that feedback loop with the cabinet is such an important part of the traditional kind of electric guitar playing. Think Jimi Hendrix or anybody that got feedback. Um, but uh, but the reality is, in a lot of these gigging situations, it becomes a difficult thing to have a big, loud cab. So what if you could make an amp that sounds really big? Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily, you know, there's a stigma about maybe 15 watts that it's going to sound like a broken up little thing. Uh, but what if you could make an amp that sounded bold and tough, but was lower power, so that brings the weight down. You don't need such big transformers yeah. and stuff, and it can become something like this. I, I, think, that, I think that was the route I was going down. You know, my, my, yeah. I've kind of gone you know when i first started working in guitar stores and stuff mm. it, it was you had 100 watts because you wanted to be you needed to be loud or you wanted to be loud and that was the reason for buying it yeah. and then kind of big stages disappeared and small stages took over so people said well actually i, I want a 20 watt amp now because i still want to i still want that crank kind of sound but yeah. i can't go that loud and it feels to me like in the last two or three years the 100 watt thing has kind of come back but not for the volume more for the expansive sort of dynamicness <coughs> yeah of, like the, of the headroom uh, yeah of the sound both, yeah. for, both for gain players and clean players probably more so for clean players but but both the john mayer sort of yeah, thing. yeah. so so now you're into this okay so it's not about it's not that i've got you know i'm playing on a big stage in front of three thousand people and you, you know i can still be playing in a small club but i want the 100 watts because it allows my guitar sound to kind of do this yeah but i you, you said something a minute ago, which I was intrigued about, was how do you get a big sounding amplifier in a in a in a small amplifier? So yeah. is that what you feel? You know, how do you, how how's that 
happened. Or you know, that's up to John. Honestly. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not fair to ask you technologically how that's happened. But is that what is that the sense you get from this? <coughs> well, I was always worried about it. And then he said, "Let me try building the you know a, a prototype." And he built this is a number of years ago. He built into this little bread box looking thing, kind of a, a, a PT one hundred. Uh, channel 2 mm-hmm. uh, with a 15 watt 6v6 power amp. A lot of people use the L84s in their mm-hmm. low powered amps these days, but he, he had this idea he wanted to try 6Vs. Uh, JJ makes a great, really consistent 6v6 tube these days that some people say sounds more like almost a cross between a 6V and a 6L6, so it's real bold. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he wanted to try it, so he built this amp, and it was like, oh my god, this thing is amazing. You know, It's just really tough sounding. It was essentially, it was this channel. So when I think about that kind of like, yeah. that, it's got nuts, you know, it sounds like... It doesn't necessarily sound like it's compressing or squishing or anything. Yeah. It's really bold sound. It doesn't sound anything like when you're playing it like that, like a Princeton Reverb or a Deluxe or something. Yeah. So I was sold. I was like, this thing's great. Well, we just didn't get around to it for a few years. But as that was 2014, 2015, I think, that he built that thing. And then IRs started to become a thing. Mm. You know, They came out with the Reactive Load product. <clears throat> and the dealers as well were all kind of screaming for lower power. Guys want lighter, they want you know smaller and all that stuff. So we were hearing it a lot, and we thought, why don't we try and put all this together in right. one package? You know. Also, the modeling thing that was coming in, and people were like, well, should I sell my amps and get you know maybe one of the floorboard modelers or yeah. something like that and go that route? I love tube amps, but geez, everybody's doing this route. Maybe I should try one of these things. And we thought, what if we could come up with a tube amp that gives people a, a, a true tube? Three channel option uh, that gives them some of the flexibility of yeah. those products. Yeah. We should just do, I mean, we're definitely geeking out here on the gear, but th- this I suspect is what you've done with the HX effects on the floor yeah. and the four cable method into the into the SUR. Yeah. And particularly with the, the IRs. Now is probably a good time to explain a little bit about what we've set up here, which sure. is it is running into a traditional guitar cabinet we've got a, a 212 with cream backs in it down there and some of what you'll hear um i don't know we'll, we'll annotate this somehow it'll tell you whether you're listening to microphones or whatever some of that you'll hear that yeah some of it you're hearing the uh speaker emulated output here so dummy load on the amplifier speaker emulation and pete will explain this amazing ir section yeah and then We'll do the demo with this. This is the bit that freaked me out, or it not freaked me out, like excited me the most, is this little, this idea that you've just got a very small powered speaker directly connected to here. Yeah. So when we play that, we'll just pick that up using our lapels or these overhead mics or something yeah. so you get a real sense of the room. But yeah, so go on, I've stolen the, the thunder a bit no, there, but okay. t- take us through the, you know, what the setup is and some tones. Yeah, the idea being kind of, it's at the core a three channel all tube amp, you know? So it's a, it's a traditional tube amplifier that you can plug into a cabinet and get a great cranked up tone. And, and we kind of talked about it's bold yeah. and it doesn't, you know, don't have a preconceived notion about the, the, the boldness of it. It's got a great, like bold, tough, punchy sound for, yeah. for a, uh, for a small, you know, smaller amp that's low power, it weighs about 24 and a half pounds. Mm-hmm. So it's real easy to, it's the exact same size as the Sir Badger. So you yeah. have a nice compact size. So at the core, you've got the three channels in there um, with, you know, independent EQ. You've got a bright switch on every channel, which is kind of nice. <laughs> And you might notice that I've got the EQ almost on five. It just yep. sounds really good tuned in with, you know, the EQ. You can start with everything on this amp on five. Everything is somewhere between four and six, the way yep. I've got it set right yeah. now, except for the overall master. And it sounds terrific, and that's by design. So, as you mentioned, I've got it hooked up here on the floor with the HX effects, which I've been using on my clinic tour right now because I'm finding it a really capable partner yeah. for the amp. So if I do this, it's going to switch over to... Channel one of the amp. I've got some compression. I'm running at four cable method, as you mentioned. So there's delay in the loop, and there's some compressor in front. Now switching over to the dirty uh, channel, dirty channel two. You know, yep. kind of the rhythm sound, and then I can go over to channel three for my lead. OK, 
Okay, so everything you're hearing right now is coming through that cabinet back there. So it sounds good. Victory cab with uh, uh -huh. cream backs? Two cream backs, yeah. Oh, two cream backs, yeah. yeah. Sounds nice. Med medium magnet cream backs in that one, yeah. It sounds oh, really good. M's, cool. Yeah. So the nice and full mids. Yeah. And it sounds great. But the neat thing about this amp, and this is the thing that I don't recommend, we're gonna, I have to switch the ohmage selector oh, let, on the let back, me do that, actually. let me do that. Yeah, so, it's a 16 ohm uh, uh, cab, and, and there's a load in this amplifier that's eight. So you're gonna wanna, uh, or, what, what we're gonna do is just turn the uh, ohmage selector And I'm eight, pulling the speaker out, and right? pull the speaker cable okay. on the back, there we go. Just to prove that there's definitely no speaker attached now. Don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> with any other amp other yeah, than this one definitely not and yeah, if, unless you understand dummy loads and what you're doing do not unplug the speaker from your bad amplifier we, sh we should explain it for a second just for those out there that don't the speaker serves as kind of the release of the power from the amplifier generally speaking so the amplifier is putting out all this watts and power and it hits the speaker and the speaker dissipates all that as sound generally speaking yes you need that because otherwise the amplifier just builds up this energy and you'll pop a fuse at best or maybe you know wreck your output transformer or blow tubes uh, at worst if you uh, if you were to disconnect the speaker from a tube amp normally but our amp has built-in sur reactive load. Now what that is, is it's designed to take that power from the amplifier and the amp still thinks it's plugged into the speaker cabinet and it just dissipates it as heat, yeah. basically, and loads the amp down to line level. So it brings it down to a nice line level signal that you yeah. can then take a direct out and either go to a PA system or recording interface. Yeah. So that's the it, concept. It's worth mentioning on that, yeah. I think sur were quite pioneering on the reactive load side of things, weren't yeah. they? Because if you go back, Dummy loads have been a thing for forever, you know, 70s, going back to the 70s and the 80s, yeah. yeah. But it was only more recently, sort of in the last maybe 10 years or so, that designers realized that actually, as a speaker was moving and sound was coming out and you were playing, the load on the amplifier is changing all yeah. the time. It's really um, Yeah, right. and the older uh, dummy loads didn't do that, so you never quite got the sense that the, the, the amp sounded right yeah. Through the through the sort of the line output, the reactive loads now, which are you know sort so of done, and are, are, I guess they're probably they're probably more common than not now. Uh, but it is all about getting the the, the load to react more like a speaker would, right. so that you you get that kind of compression when it when you want it and the openness when you don't. And exactly. um, anyway, so yeah, so we got so reactive load on here coming out the line out, but yep. of course that's you're still missing one unbelievably important. Yeah part of the chain aren't you so it's the speaker sound yeah so tell us I, I have to be honest with you i i didn't really understand what irs were when they first came out and i ended up watching quite a lot of your videos to to sort of go you know because we were doing demos of products not really understanding that we needed irs going this sounds <laughs> you know right. it's like why does it why would anybody use this yeah and then of course not realizing that you know, I know now. But tell us what an IR is, and 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 you personally, you've come up with some really cool ones yourself as well. So thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, I got really excited about IRs a number of years ago when I started uh, making my own. I tried making my own, and that's when I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Because the thing about it is, what an IR is, impulse response. It's basically digital speaker simulation, and you can kind of take a digital picture of what let's say those microphones look like on that cabinet, in that position on that particular speaker, and you can kind of bottle that sound and put it into a little digital file and then essentially recreate that sound. If you run your amplifier into a reactive load like we've got, load it down to line level and then run it through that file, you've got that sound again. So that means that you can you know, get a great mic'd up cabinet sound and then take that with you wherever you go and it's consistent night after night and it's just really killer. So the only way that I really, uh, was able to determine like how great this was by was by making my own because mm -hmm. then I had a mic'd up cabinet you know that was isolated in another room sounded great with the amp and I got it all dialed in and I listened to it then I made an impulse response which is basically like you have to hook up a power amp then to the cabinet and run a test tone out from your computer through the cabinet and it captures all the frequencies that are going on and all the Id idiosyncrasies of that particular speaker and the microphones and puts it into this little file. Then you're able to like load down the amplifier and listen to it through that file and then I could go right back to the mics in the cab and yeah. hear them A, B. Yeah. And I was like, I can't hear a difference. It's the same sound. Recently I've been doing some IR stuff uh, make, making some and we, we did this thing the other day where we made an IR and then we had the mic'd up sound as well and I was using a looper pedal to actually run a mm -hmm. guitar loop through it so it was a consistent riff 
and I'm listening to it, and we, rec we recorded the IR and recorded the mic'd up signal. We cut out portions of the IR and the mic signal so that at one point it's the IR, and then it's the mic signal, and then it's the IR, and then it's the mic signal. It plays seamlessly. Right. You cannot hear a difference in the tone. Oh, and we can, we can back. demo that. That's, we'll do that in a minute, I think. Cause well, this is a little different. I don't want to give people the wrong idea because the only thing about this is you've got your mic'd up cab yeah. and then I've got my IRs in here. Oh, I with, see. So no, it's a slightly right. different sound, but, we can, but it's an equally good sound. We can <laughs> do a piece of playing where people play something and we'll show you the mic'd up cab and then we'll do another piece of, the same piece of playing yeah. and we'll get the cloak. But it's, we, we were doing this during sort of our sort of mini sound checky kind of thing and yeah. trying to decide should we use the line out or should we use the, the, the mics? And, and normally, I'll be totally honest with you, normally we'll default to the mics because sure. in the room we'll end up going, no, there's just something. And in this one, we were generally going, it doesn't matter. Yeah. They both sound great. Two great sounds. Um, yeah. So uh, I do think what's clever about this, now you, you, we talk about IRs and you know, if you were to, to, to have a, a Fender amplifier versus a Marshall amplifier kind of mm. thing, you know, a massive characteristic of those tones is the fact that they use very different speakers and open back versus closed back and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So the idea of just having one IR to cover everything mm. is kind of, it's not ideal, is it? You, you want multiple IRs and you've managed to build that into the amplifier That's in a right. way I've, I've yeah. only ever really seen done before on... You know, on, on like a Helix or, or a Kemp or something, or sorry, uh, an Axe FX or something. Sure, a modeling amp, yeah. So tell us about, you know, A, how many you can have, and yeah. B, how you're changing them. So we've got um, 16 slots for IRs in here, which means you can have 16 different cabinet sounds. So imagine you've got your recording studio, you know, with 16 different cabs, all, all mic'd up and ready to go at any given time. <laughs> yeah. And to, to us, it was like, well, how many more cabinet sounds do you really need? Yeah, 16 I mean, is plenty, isn't it? Yeah, you could have your, you know, your 410s, your 212s, your open backs, your closed backs, whatever you want. So we, we yeah. uh, include with the amp, a whole host of Celestian impulse responses. Um, they recently did a, I think they call it the Backline Heroes, and it's like they took a bunch of Sir cabinets, made IRs, yeah. and they, they have those packages available on their site. So they let us use those IRs for the amplifier. Cool. I also made some custom blends where I went yeah. in and changed their factory stock IRs a little bit and blended a few of them to come up with some, some yeah. sounds of my own. So yeah, so like for instance, on the clean channel of the amplifier, uh, I've got uh, the fourth bank. So there's, there's four banks of four each. So I 16. Yeah. So this is bank number four, number one, uh, IR number one and bank number four. And it's an open back uh, 112, the way that it pops up. So See? you guys are hearing the DI straight out. We're hearing it through this in the room, but we'll we'll come back to that as well. Yeah, because we want you to hear what this sounds yeah. like just through the mics in yeah. here as well. But so, so this will be... That'll be an open back 112. Okay, the Sir Bella actually with a V-type speaker mm -hmm. in it. That's what that is, open back cabinet. If I hit this button right here, it's gonna be my custom blend now. It's gonna be a little darker and warmer. If somebody wanted maybe to add a little bit of overdrive to that sound, wanted, you know, no hint of mm -hmm. fizz or hair on the top. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. So I made a darker one. Okay, and you know, as you push this, it's just going to go through a couple more open back cabs. The number four one in here is like the the, um, the Hedgehog cabinet, which is a uh, 65s and a 212. More scoop sound. Okay, so that's that's some of my open back cabinets that I've got in there, which are nice for the clean channel, I think. Um, if we go over to the, to the, uh, the HX effects here, switch to channel two. This is now a green back loaded 412 with a blend of a 57 and a 121 on it. Great for any kind of, you know. Tones like that, just sure. a, that great greenback thing. If I go to channel three, it's going to load up. Let's see you'll you'll notice as well that the the helix is controlling the uh, the which IR is selected as well. So it's a real one yeah. foot switch solution. This is which it, I love, man. Yeah. I got used to using switchers years ago, and it's like I want to hit one button and have yeah. everything change. <laughs> yeah, I love that now. It's tap dancing, I just can't do it. <laughs> But uh, so this is now a blend of actually a greenback cab and a V30 cab, and I made this blend, and this is the lead channel. 
switching getting different cabinet tones as you go from one channel to the other That's and once great. again you're just hearing the di out now so yeah, it's DI a great out. idea very yeah. cool idea let's go back to we'll put the speaker cabinet in and we'll go right okay 20 seconds of this then 20 seconds of the di out and then 20 seconds of what this sounds like yeah, without cool. changing anything on the amplifier i like that idea cool. That's cool right so apart from perhaps compensating for the level which we might do we're going to leave all the settings all the same and yeah you just play a riff over and we'll change. So here's yeah. the cab. This is the cab. And now, by the power of me not having to do anything at all, my favorite feature is you're just gonna hear this, which is a, a little Genelec, it's the smallest little Genelec powered studio monitor that they make, connected right to the amplifier. So imagine you're just, and this is pretty quiet. You, you may not get a sense in here of how quiet this is, but this is like definitely, volume. yeah, it's like home use, quiet volume. Anyway, yeah. let's have a listen. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds great. And we were talking before camera as well. A, a relatively new experience for me recently has been trying to use headphones more for, for playing. Yeah. And I just hate it. Right, right. Um, and I, I think you were saying, whether it's in-ear or headphones, it's a very different guitar sound that you have to sort of yeah, get yeah. used to as a player. You do. Um, yeah. In a, it's sort of getting used to in a look, don't worry that it sounds crap, because it won't, you know, yeah. but it just... Yeah. Well, not crap's the wrong word, but it's just so uninspiring. Isn't I agree. It, you know? Well, and the, the thing with this is that, you know, it sounds great coming out of here, right? And you can imagine if you're at a gig where it's like, we don't want cabs on stage. Well, what about if you had like a little powered monitor that was close to you or facing up at you? Yeah. You know, because if you got a killer, part of the problem, you know, with wedge is a lot of people are like, oh, I don't like the way my guitar sounds in a wedge. Many times that's because you're not really like spending a, a lot of time miking it in a club or something. You know, you're just throwing that 57 or whatever you're using kind of somewhere. And then the wedge is probably kind of like not such a great, you know, and they're throwing it back at you in your face. And you're like, God, it sounds harsh or whatever. Well, imagine having a perfectly miked sound yeah. and then maybe a powered monitor of your choice that you could use yeah. on your gig and that's what you know something like this it yeah. just knocks me out when i hear through this because like i could live yeah. with that yeah. i can hear it. it sounds good it feels good when i'm playing it's cool you know the other thing that we should mention is that it's got a uh I saw. Jack. yeah so you know if you want to take this amp backstage before the gig just silently with headphones and be practicing. It's even got an aux in, so you can run like a phone or computer. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, sit there, jam, go over your set, do whatever you need to do. Go out, put this thing on stage, plug it into a cab if you want or don't, yeah. you know, take the DI out if you want or don't. It's just that tube amp you can use in every possible how many situation. Time, how many times has this happened to you where you've got your own 212 cab yeah. and you've marked where you want the microphone with the piece of right, right. tech with that? And, and it's like, but I, the mic time here, it's just like, <laughs> what else have I got to do? It's like. That's but, right. I always say that where it's like, you know, yeah, well, you play the gig and it's like, oh, I was on tonight. That was cool. And then somebody's like, yeah, I couldn't really hear you in the PA. And you're like, what? And you look at the cab and the mic's dangling. <laughs> Somebody kicked it over and you're like, <laughs> you know, what are you supposed to do? So uh. this is consistent and sounds great. <laughs> Yeah, the kind of the experience that that the fellow here helping us, you know, that was plugging into the the system to record. Yeah. It's like normally I favor the mics, but this is wow, this DI sounds amazing. Yeah. That's the experience I have over and over with engineers yeah. using using this amp. So I'll either in the studio or when I take it to gigs, they're like, yeah, let's just mic up the cab, and I say just take the DI and take a listen, and yeah. they listen to it and they're like. Oh my God! I'm going to use yeah. the DI. You know, yeah, every time, and presumably so. you can do it simultaneously as well. So yes. you, you've still got you can have the cab on stage for your own monitoring, and the sound guy gets the the IR the the, the DI. Sorry, with the IR. That's exactly yeah. right. And the neat thing about that is, you know, you go to a lot of gigs, and they've got you got to use the house cab mm -hmm. many times. I find, you know. I'm not worried about that anymore because it's like, yeah. well, it could have 75s or it could have 30s, it could have 20, whatever, as long as I can hear myself on stage, get a bit of feedback because I yeah. know what's in the PA yeah. and that the people are hearing or whatever's getting recorded is that IR that I chose. 
Well, that that's is, cool. That is great. Well, this is a this is a cool piece of kit. Um, yeah, but I will definitely. We've got these in stock, so I need to I need to have a you know play around myself and see. It sounds like it could be cool to use in here. Um, but I'm glad you like it. Yeah, it's very yeah. cool, and and it's great to see. Uh, do you think you'll do you think you'll ever go back to a conventional pedal board, or is that just the the fact that Helix now, or you know, right? It's the quality of the effects is very good, and the four cable method, and the it it just takes a lot of you grief know, away, doesn't it? Like if I show you what I'm doing with this thing on my clinic, I'm playing this tune. Like I'm I'm out here uh, uh, doing a, a run of European clinics, basically, and in the clinic, I actually record a track. That's kind of what I'm doing, and I and I talk about you know tonal choices and musical choices, and, and also releasing your own music independently and all kinds of things. So I needed to travel light. This is I just want to say really quick. This is kind of like the. Uh, the, the, the genesis of my career is that I'm not a, a John Petrucci or a Steve Vai necessarily that's a real stylist and gets to, you know, like their guitars and their gear rep represents the evolution of them writing their original music and, yeah. and doing exactly what they want to do. My career has been more as a touring side guy where I need mm -hmm. to cover a, a bunch of tones and sometimes travel yeah. very light, much yeah. like probably most of you guys out there where it's like gigging musicians, whatever you can throw over your shoulder and fit in the car, you know, and that's that's kind of who I am. So yeah. you'll you'll see that reflected in the gear that I choose, you know, in the design of this and in my guitar and everything. So for the clinic tour, HX Effects from Line Six has been a real boon. Now I've got a nice pedal board at home mm -hmm. that you know is a pretty full size, 30 inches wide, 18 high, something like that, and that's what I generally use. But this thing has been killer. I can throw it in my backpack mm -hmm. and I can get a whole bunch of sounds. So I'll just show you, it's a real capable partner for the amp. Um, the clean sound that I had when when I've been playing the clean channel is just some echo and compression. And then I've got that dirty rhythm tone switches to basically dry. I do a part in the song that's a, a fuzz bass thing that's an octave shifted down and with fuzz. So. Kind of like that, real dirty, you know? And so that's fun on this thing. And then I got my lead channel. So I've got that sound going too. Even on my dirty rhythm tone, I almost forgot, I got an Octavia, which, which works really well in this thing. And a real nasty Octavia yeah. phaser in there if I wanted to. So this thing has been a real fun, capable partner, I yeah. find, for the amp. Uh, I, I actually took this over here and I played on uh, it was this morning, that yes. show you guys have. And this was the same rig I used. I used this uh, with, with uh, uh, the uh, classic rock show. I used this uh, with the amplifier and you know, I was able to cover a whole range of tones with it. So I'm all about using what I need to do to get the job done and fit within the parameters of like travel, you know, yeah. and not, not having excess bags and things like that. Well, know? I mean, if that can be yeah. your amp's foot switch and all the effects you need and able to change the IRs and it's, yeah. it's the size of like a notepad. Yeah. If the tones are good yeah. and if your paycheck doesn't change, <laughs> <laughs> you know, why break your back? It's like, I, I want the sound, the sound has to be great, you know, at the core. It's gotta be like up to the standard where you're having a good time mm -hmm. and it feels great. But beyond that, it's like, if I've gotta choose like, oh, I've gotta bring this giant Pelican road case with my pedal board and I'm gonna go $100 excess bag fee and this, and that, and, and it's like not really that much different, I'm, I'm all about uh, convenience to a yep. point, you know, so, yeah. So, well, uh, what a great way of kind of coming back to the, the now. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you've got this um, Brit Rock thing next year for the first month or two of next year, which sounded cool. But to, yeah. what what is what does the foreseeable future hold for you? Well, we're we're doing uh, this European clinic run right now, and then we're talking about Asia maybe coming up. So that's still on the planning stages and the, the the drawing board. But possibly towards you know November December, if we can put something together, I'd love to do a run of the clinic that I'm doing now yeah. in places like you know Japan, South Korea, you know that and and, and head over there. So we're going to see if that is something that we can put together January, February. Yeah, the folks that do the, the Brit Floyd show, yeah. uh, they've got something called Classic Rock Show. Classic that, Rock, sorry. Yeah, and they asked me if I would come play with them. And I said, sure, that sounds like fun. You know, the only thing I'm gonna miss is NAM. Can't make it a NAM this year, because I'm gonna be over here <sighs> Never mind. jamming with them. But yeah, uh, so I'm gonna do that. And then there's a whole slew of, uh, you know, of videos and stuff on the horizon that I gotta get to, as well as 
Uh, what's the one thing that I'm missing right now? Ah, yes, gigs with Ultimate Queen Celebration as well with Mark oh, Martell. Cool. So I've got I've got some gigs coming up with them. So it's a bit of a hodgepodge. Are you stuff. using a Brian May um, yeah, guitar for that as well? I do. My friend John Shanks uh, has a uh, it, it it says Brian May guitars or something on yeah, it yeah. Or, or Red Special guitars. Yeah. I think it says and he had it commissioned. I guess it's a guy that builds them for Brian and it's a very expensive. You know, custom oh, so he's version. got because there is a regular Brian May, you know, affordable guitar. It's not but, that one. So he's you've got like a, a custom made. Yeah, version of that, have John you? Shanks is like talk about a gear nerd. Oh my god, <laughs> there's no. There, uh, let me just tell you, there is <laughs> there is nobody that oh, has okay. stuff like John Shanks. Yeah, we're talking multiple fifties Les Pauls and Marshalls of every single uh, era, and you know, high some of the first high watt amps ever made. He AC thirties. He's just crazy about gear, and he's a great you know, he, uh, Bon Jovi producer yeah. and plays guitar with yeah. him as well. And he's a good friend of mine. So he, when he found out I was playing some Queen music, he said, "I, I got to take care of you. Come over here." And he gave me this guitar to use, and he gave me the Cornish treble booster. And said, just take all this. And so, um, are you using a stack of eighty thirties so. as well for that gig? Or? No, I'm actually it's AX8 for that, which is the what? Fractal, yeah. I Brian know. May has I, just unsubscribed from this channel as you've said that. <laughs> it's literally no, it's a good it's a good unit, and I'll tell you why I use I started using it was because Tristan Abaki and their main guitar player, the guy that yeah. uh, is the you know primary guitarist in that band. He used it, and he said, uh, "I'll send you my presets if you want." And I have one, and I put them in, and it sounds great. And the and the board recordings from their shows sounded great. So I thought for this gig, this thing is terrific. And uh, I've known those folks at Fractal for a long time. So, like I say, I'm about using what gets the job done and what I can get there, and not uh, incur excess bag fees and overweight I, fees. It's so. funny you, you talk about a a, yeah. uh, a very close friend of ours who uh, isn't here today, but you guys can probably work out who I'm talking about. Did, does a lot of the music for X Factor on the UK. Oh, all yeah. pre-recorded stuff like that. Okay. And all the Queen stuff from, you know, 10 million people watching, all, it's all just using the amp modeling in Logic. It's not even an output. It's just like, yeah. and nobody, nobody, nobody watches tell. X Factor and goes, oh, I didn't think that guitar sound did quite right. You know, it's just yeah. like, so I yeah. think it's like you say, get the job done, take yeah. the fee, Move on to the next job. You know? It's kind of the way it is these days. I mean, I try and balance it. That's the same. You're seeing it reflected. Like, I still want a tube amp, you know. And and it's you know you see how like you you were sitting here going God, and you get kind of excited about it. Yeah. That's how do you put a price on that? You know, if it could it could sound great recorded and maybe sound great in the house and stuff. But if you're not totally jazzed on it, mm -hmm. mm, that's still an issue. Something like this that gives you a bit of like ah right yeah you know that's and then you play different. That that you know? for me is still I think. You know, if I look at 25, 30 years of working, selling gear, yeah. that's what's happened with, with guitar tone, generally speaking, is it's gone from at the beginning where it was like, yeah, the cheap gear sounded crap and the good gear sounded good. So if mm. you want to sound good, you have to have the good gear. Mm. Now it's just like the, the, the difference is marginal, but, but the person who's playing, yeah. that's, where, that's where you can justify, I think, still buying the good gear. Because the person going, you know what, there is still something and I do yeah. play better when I when I'm really feeling it. Well, I mean, um, if we take it down to what if Jimi Hendrix had been, you know, told, you can't play that loud in the clubs in London or whatever, turn down. He went, okay, and then he did, <laughs> and he, instead of just going, hey man, this is my sound. Yeah. We wouldn't have had that music. No, he, for sure. You know, all, it all gets distilled down to an MP3 or something and listen through earbuds, but listen to Hendrix and what's going on, and that wild, out of control, crazy thing is a reflection of him playing off that m amazing sound that he had going, and you know, that's, it's hard to put a, if we want the guitar to become sort of a, you know, uh, a synthesized facsimile of something that it was, you know, that's one thing. But if you want to have a dangerous instrument that moves people, there ain't no substitute for the old school. <laughs> that may just yeah. be the most important guitar quote of the 21st century, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll write that down. <laughs> uh, well, look, it's fantastic. Really, I mean, we've never really properly met. We bumped into each other a couple of nams just to say hello, like YouTube hello. Uh, but it's been brilliant. I Thanks, really, man. really enjoyed having you on. Uh, great to hear about your career and loving the gear that you're using. And Thank I you. wish you all the success. Uh, so there you go. If for some bizarre reason, this is the first time you've seen Pete on, on YouTube. Go and I'll put links in the description below. You can find out more about him. But uh, anyway. Can't thank, thank you enough for having me. No, not me. at all, man. Really appreciate thank it. you guys for watching and we'll see you next time. See you guys. Yay! Cool. Boom. That was good. Yeah. I think. Yeah, nice. That was good. Yeah. And look at that. We just we just smashed straight through. It was like... Yeah. Two, two pros. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. And a nice it was good. Yeah. yeah, cool. Oh, yeah. That's very, very cool. Um, yeah, it's, thanks.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's 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 definitely moment, right? <laughs> yeah.